Now, I, I was speaking to a doctor when I was at university and he'd seen a guy who'd been taking pro-hormones that he bought off the internet. And he, he was saying that he was so suppressed, his testicles just basically didn't exist anymore. They were like peanuts. And the guy didn't understand why or how that could have happened because they were pro-hormones and he got them legally from the internet. Hi guys, my name's Alistair Kennett and I'm the co-founder and managing director of Optima. And so I'm here with Tom. He's one of the researcher and patient support managers at Optimo. So we're going to be talking about testosterone boosters, whether they work or not. We get a lot of patients who come to us, patients and also guys who aren't yet on kind of any treatment. They do blood tests and they are taking these testosterone boosters. We often see a number of different things. What do you normally see, Tom, when you have guys coming over and they're either on them or they take a test and then they start taking a testosterone booster and then they retest? In the vast majority of cases, there's just absolutely no increase whatsoever. No change, at least outside the realms of normal natural fluctuation. And that is absolutely what we would expect to see predominantly because the vast majority of the ingredients in these products have no actual scientific evidence that they increase testosterone levels at least to a significant degree. And this is because when you understand how complex the process of testosterone production is, how many different inputs go into it, how many different systems modulate the production from the hypothalamus all the way down to the actual production of steroids within the testes themselves, just taking a little bit of zinc or a little bit of vitamin D outside the realms of severe chronic deficiency, which is for the most part quite rare in, in the West, at least with regards to zinc and other minerals. It's just not going to have an impact on a man who is clinically deficient in testosterone, at least to a degree where it would increase levels to a point where symptom resolution is achieved, which is the whole point of trying to increase your testosterone levels because it's great having a number on a piece of paper look better, but if it only goes up by three, four, five nanomol per liter, you don't actually feel better, then what have we actually done there? Essentially nothing. You could argue that there are some guys uh, in the UK right now, probably, you know, a reasonable percentage, you have a vitamin D deficiency in particular. You could potentially argue that if you were taking a, a decent amount of vitamin D, that could have a, a small impact on your testosterone production. But I imagine that's a very small percentage of the population where you'd actually see a, a significant increase in testosterone levels. It is supported in the literature and there is a statistically significant increase in testosterone levels. But for the most part, we're talking in the region of three, four, five nanomol per liter, which again, if someone's borderline, then that could be enough to push them up into a region where they get symptom resolution. But if we're mm -hmm. talking about men who are clinically deficient, well below the British Society for Sexual Medicine guidelines, is that going to be enough to, to get them where they need to be? Probably not. And they should still supplement with vitamin D regardless, because it's an extremely important hormone. It's, it's not even a vitamin, technically. It, it, it is a hormone in, in its own right. And it's extremely important for general health. A lot of people know its role within bone health, but it, it's so much more than that. So it is an important thing to check and correct if deficient, but on its own, it's probably not going to correct severe hypogonadism. I think the other point to make here which I wasn't aware of, but th there are a lot of people who s kind of super dose vitamin D, uh, mega dose it, and they take a, a huge amount of vitamin D daily for whatever reason. That can actually cause toxicity. That and vitamin C actually as well, you shouldn't be taking way over the kind of recommended daily allowance of vitamin C or vitamin D. Vitamin C in particular can lead to kidney stones as well. That's something I, I didn't realize. I thought you just kind of weed it out if you had extra, um, but it actually impacts the um, kidney stone formation. I guess the other thing to say about these, these testosterone boosters is they don't normally have vitamin D in them. A lot of the time they have these other kind of herbs, which the research around them is woolly. The classic one is tribulus terrestris, uh, which you see everywhere in, in all of these testosterone boosters. And I think it's because there, there's, there are one or two very poor studies which showed increases in testosterone levels after taking it for a few weeks. Now, I, I remember I took it when I was a teenager, didn't notice any difference at all. Yeah, they're often very poorly designed studies that, when repeated with more appropriate methodology, don't produce the same results as the initials do. Because if it genuinely was as simple as taking some tribulus or other herbs or zinc or B6 or magnesium, that's what everyone would be doing. There'd be absolutely no reason to be injecting yourself multiple times per week. And 
spending money on healthcare, you know, under, under the supervision of a doctor, because because that is absolutely needed if you're going to do TRT safely. Nobody would do it. We would just take over the kind of vitamins and minerals, and and everything would be would be perfect. Well, they'd be banned as well, wouldn't they? If tribulus terrestris really boosted your testosterone levels significantly, you wouldn't be allowed to take them in any kind of sporting environment. I'd, as far as I'm aware, that's not the case. Another one which is quite recently has become more prevalent, I would say, in t- testosterone boosters that I've seen is diaspartic acid. And again, it had a, a few studies that showed that it, you know, one of them was 30 to 60 percent increase in testosterone levels in men. But then there have been just as many studies that haven't been able to repeat those results and have actually shown that the testosterone levels either decreased, which again, again, could just be a poorly designed study or it wasn't powerful enough to see a, to see any results. And some of the other studies showed that there was, there was no increase at all in testosterone levels. It kind of indicates, you know, if you're not getting repeatable results, that it's too good to be true. Again, it, it comes back to the fact that the production of testosterone is influenced by neurotransmitters like dopamine, serotonin, other hormones like cortisol and thyroid. On the actual cellular level, mitochondrial health, because a lot of people don't know the the steroid hormone cascade where cholesterol is converted into to the precursor hormone pregnenolone is actually within the mitochondrial itself and, and mitochondrial health is directly correlated with the efficiency of that process. And then when you consider the, the more macro uh, impact of diet, lifestyle, stress, genetics, exercise, all these different things, when you summate that into one large picture, again, it's, it's not surprising that just taking a few vitamins and minerals doesn't increase levels, especially to a significant degree. If you're really looking to boost your testosterone levels naturally, you'd be better off eating well, losing body fat, exercising, and getting at least eight eight hours of sleep every night. This is the other thing we've seen, I think, isn't it? Some guys say, I've got all the symptoms of low testosterone, been taking this testosterone booster. I felt good for a week and now I just don't feel very good at all. And they get the testosterone results back and LH and FSH results and it shows that they're suppressed. So they actually have a low testosterone and suppressed luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone. I mean, what what do you think is happening there? Because the supplement industry is, for the most part, completely unregulated. There's no regulatory body that is ensuring that what is in the tubs that you're being sold is actually what's in them. Unethical companies can often spike these products with anabolic steroids, uh, oral steroids like uh, Dynabol, for example. There's a wide range of, of other androgens that, that are often used that do shut down your own production of testosterone. So for the first few weeks before your own production gets shut down, you're essentially just getting the benefits, not from a health perspective, obviously, because they're very dangerous, but from a subjective feel-good point of view, you're getting the benefits of taking Uh, an oral steroid essentially which is uh, associated with increased strength increased energy increased sex drive but then the longer you take that eventually your hypothalamus detects the increase in in um in in circulating androgens and if it's an aromatizable androgen like dianabol is the increase in estrogen too and then it will quite quickly shut off your own production of of testosterone by suppressing luteinizing hormone and and follicle stimulating hormone release which for those who don't know are the two hormones that stimulate the testes to produce testosterone and sperm cells respectively so you're essentially shutting off your own production entirely taking these supplements that are spiked i guess kind of like an aside to that is pro hormones which uh is kind of a misnomer really because pro hormones are basically anabolic compounds that have been slightly edited so that they have they basically have anabolic effects but at the same time they are not technically you know something like danabol or testosterone or androstenedione or one of these compounds that that has an impact or may have an impact or is seen to have an impact on anabolism a lot of the time these pro hormone companies basically just find ways that they can slightly change the chemical structure of these anabolic compounds so that they're not regulated put them in a pro hormone mix and you know, your average guy down the gym doesn't understand that it's still going to have a very suppressive impact on your HPTA, so basically your, your natural testosterone production. They take it, they might notice some gains, but as soon as they stop, massively suppressed. And that's not to mention all of the negative side effects that you get from most of these pro-hormones, which tend to be actually, they tend to have more negative impact on your uh, lipid profile and various other aspects of your health than actually taking something like testosterone would. You know, I I was speaking to a doctor when I was at university and he'd seen a guy who'd been taking pro-hormones 
that he bought off the internet. And he, he was saying that he was so suppressed, his testicles just basically didn't exist anymore. They were like peanuts. And the guy didn't understand why or how that could have happened because they were pro-hormones and he got them f- legally from the internet. I think it's less common now for pro-hormones because they've basically, most of the uh, possible kind of structures have been made illegal now. Yeah, definitely. There's no long-term safety profile for any of these compounds and it's somewhat common that we have fellas, usually older in their 30s and 40s, who report that they haven't felt right for 10, 15 years and it all started after after pro-hormone use or from the use of over-the-counter testosterone boosters that probably contained some sort of pro-hormone from the era that those were relatively prevalent. Yeah, and I think the kind of the new pro-hormone nowadays is SARMs. Again, very similar kind of thing. They're marketed as being steroid effects without the side effects. You know, things like Osterine was a classic one a couple of years ago. I'm sure it's still available. This will give you loads of muscle gain and you won't have any negative impact because it's not a steroid. But actually, it turns out that it's, it's pretty suppressive mm-hmm. and you will probably get some muscle gains but it also impacts your lipid profile. So really there's there's no difference yeah. between taking osterine to taking one of the old school old school pro hormones. There are some psalms that are purported to be less suppressive than others. Um some yeah. of those psalms we've still we've still seen them suppress pe- um people's testosterone production in clinic. Is that because they were told they were getting one thing and sold another thing? Maybe that's another risk of buying these these, these products online. Psalms themselves don't have all that much um, safety data with regards to human use. So again, you're, you're, you're taking a, a huge risk with your health there. Um, a lot of the time, it doesn't make sense to even use these compounds rather than just using testosterone. Not that you should use either of them without a prescription, but when you look at the safety profile and the fact that they're still suppressive regardless, it, it does make you think, what's the point in general? It's not worth it at all. At least you know the, the side effects and potential side effects of injecting testosterone, whereas taking a SARM tablet, you're literally a guinea pig. It could cause cancer, for all we know. It could completely shut down your kidneys. There's absolutely no way of knowing because there's no safety data on it. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I mean, some of them, I think, do have some safety data on them now. It's crazy. And on top of that, as you said, you have no idea what's in them. You don't know whether you're getting Osterine or if you're getting some other random SARM that they've decided to put in. Yeah, definitely. And I think the only other potential spiking agent that, that is used in some of these products is clomiphene, clomiphene citrate. So it's quite common for, for guys to have a low reading, as we said, go off, start a testosterone booster, get retested again, actually report some benefits. And instead of having a suppressed LH and FSH, you actually see them grossly elevated. And for those that don't know, um, clomiphene is a is what's called a selective estrogen receptor modulator. It's usually referred to as a as a serm, and it blocks receptors in the pituitary that the pituitary and the hypothalamus, but the pituitary use to detect the levels of circulating estrogen in the body. So when you block those estrogens, those receptors, I should say, an estrogen can no longer bind. What happens is the pituitary and, and hypothalamus think that your body is deficient in estrogen and because estrogen is produced from testosterone in men. It ramps up the production of testosterone to fix the what it perceives to be a circulating deficiency in estrogen. So that can also happen too. And, and high dose selective estrogen receptor modulator use is associated with a whole host of issues in its own right, particularly clomiphene with vision issues and retinal detachment, but also just mood instability and other rather unpleasant symptoms that, again, you shouldn't be taking this drug without the supervision of a, of a doctor. I mean, there's a reason that we we don't tend to use it very often in clinic either. It doesn't have the best results in terms of symptomatic relief and side effects, in our experience at least. I know that in the US they've started using it instead of using HCG, but that's because only because HCG now cannot be compounded. So previously it was allowed to be compounded and they, they could get it at a good price. And it sounds like the pharmaceutical companies basically put some pressure on the FDA to have it uh, outlawed. I don't know the full, the full details, but that, that's what I've heard. And as a result of that, you can only get from pharmaceutical companies, which means the price has gone up substantially. They basically now use clomiphene, low dose, as a kind of replacement. It'd be interesting to talk to, to get some American hormone doctors on here to talk to them about clomid use in America to see what results they get and how men feel on it, that kind of thing, and what dosing they use. Definitely. I mean, in in our experience, typically Clomid will increase a man's testosterone levels. And at least at the start, that that is usually associated with some degree of um, improvement to their symptomatology. But it rarely lasts because, again, we would be using it 
most people report that the symptoms come back or they start to develop unpleasant side effects. Again, like I said before, issues with the retina, mood issues, water retention, just unpleasant issues that, that make it a largely unviable long-term solution for the treatment of low testosterone. Thanks again for listening, guys. Um, don't forget to like and subscribe. As always, if you've got any ideas or things you'd like us to talk about, then let us know. Or if you've got any questions, put them below in the comments section. And if you, you want to watch some of our other videos, there should be some popping up on the screen. And then you can click on those and watch those. All right. Thanks a lot and speak to you soon.